Next up is public comment. This is comment on anything that is not on the agenda. And keep in mind, this is for a quick update or something you'd like the board to put on the agenda at a later date that is only a brief statement. I've got maybe one quick one just as a Zoom thing. Um, and that's okay. we use the owl. It's just, we're gonna, Keep folks muted for the most part, or if you can mute yourself, just because that's where we're getting some of the echoey feedback stuff we've had the last couple of meetings. So if you're muted, it's not because we don't want to hear your voice. It just prevents that feedback loop. And then if you can unmute to pop in or raise a hand or anything like that, that'll help help out with the sound quality. All right. Do we have anybody on that item? Not seeing anybody. Let's move to approval of the agenda. I'll move to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Consent calendar. We have some meeting minutes, some warrants, and some cemetery plots. Those things just go together so well. <laughs> we all wind up in C at some point, right? So. Correct. Just not tonight, please. <clears throat> I'm not sure that we all end up in C. Well, that's yeah, true. Apparently. Some of us, yeah, wind up on a mantelpiece or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Nice conversation. <laughs> uh, I, I move approval of the consent agenda. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is to consider the Kimball Public Library Cupolo grant question. So this is one that originally came to you in October, I think it was, with a, a grant request. There's a $20,000 historic preservation grant that you were asked to authorize the application for, which you did. But the question that still remains from that is, this is a, an estimated $200,000 project. And so obviously it's $20,000, we're, we're a few thousand shy with just the grant. Um, and so there was a proposal from the KPL trustees at that point for uh, the use of some McNair funds and then the use of some town capital funds to make up the rest of it. So it's a $20,000 grant. You have $40,000 in the pledged funds. And then the remaining one forty dollars would come out of the capital funds that we have in our facilities reserve. And that makes the two hundred. dollars And this would do the cupola repair that's needed, fix the leaks, fix some of the copper cladding. Uh, and, uh, and, and be a, a longer term, more durable fix to some pieces that have been discussed for years and years. Um, and so a $20,000 grant doesn't usually drive us forward, but this is a project that's been in the, in the water supply for a little bit. Um, we have that money in that facilities reserve. We've got about 203,000 in there as of the other day. Um, that's after the transfer for this year. Um, so there's the money in there to do it. it is, in that capital plan for fiscal 22, so we were thinking we would do it. Um, the only challenge might be is that if we do this at the 140, there are two other projects in there that we wish wouldn't have enough to fund with the remaining 63,000 bucks. So we'd either have to figure out where that extra revenue that was anticipated comes from and make sure we go get that, or we'd have to maybe rescope some of those things. Um, or because of the timing, the difficulty everybody's having finding anybody to do the work, you know, some of these other factors beyond our control because of COVID might push those timelines timelines out anyway. So, um, and we do have time that if we need to make adjustments that then trickle into the next fiscal year and into the capital planning going out, we can do that. The big project that, that remains after this, planned for 22, is repairs to the skylight, some of the leaks here at the town, town offices. That's about a $75,000 project in that capital plan. Um, so we'll just have to make sure we can figure out how to either make that work or where it goes. Um, but the money's there, um, this project was planned, and so it's just whether or not you, you're ready to move forward with it at this point. So when we did, uh, when Chandler came in with their request 
for the roof and whatnot, we challenged them by having a conversation about us coming up with half of it at the town level and then doing a capital campaign to come up with the balance. Um, so seeing that Robin and Amy are on, is that a realistic approach? I'm going to defer to Amy on that to at least to start. Okay, sure. <laughs> My point of view here is that unlike Chandler Center for the Arts, where the building is owned by the town, but it's managed by um, a nonprofit, a private nonprofit, the library is in fact a town owned building that's managed by elected town officials. So I, to me, it seems as though the, it's, it's the taxpayer's responsibility really um, to pay for the maintenance and repairs that the building requires. I've been able to get a ton of grants for the past 20 years to certainly help you for the cost. Um, and I'm really fingers crossed for that 20,000 from the Division for Historic Preservation. Um, but I think information that was not included in that packet that we received um, really shows that the taxpayers have not been asked to pay for a lot of the capital improvements that have been made on the building. Um, I think I have information back to 2009, which I'm happy to screen share with you. So the burden on the taxpayers has really been quite light. Well, there's, um... If you want to single out the budget, you could say that. But if you look at the entire program around the library, I don't know that it's been light. Um, and Chandler has had uh, funding left to them. They've had different fundraisers and whatnot. And uh, yes, there's kind of a separate thing there. It's kind of a mix. Um, but there's some similarities you can draw to the library, too. There's you know, kind of folks that are think, really focused yeah. on it and supporters of it and whatnot. So I'm just wondering, you know, similar to other entities and other, you know, um, separate types of, of focuses, has there been any thought about doing any type of a capital campaign to help fund this versus putting it on to the tax dollar? I, I do not think that the trustees have thought about using a capital campaign for repairs to the building as it exists now. We have we have certainly had conversations about capital campaigns to do what Chandler did to their building, which was significantly expand and improve many parts of it. Uh, but this is this is so so I sat on the Chandler board for a really long time and I I would say that this is this is a maintenance issue of a building that the town owns Trini. Um, when when Chandler did their capital campaign it was not for maintenance issues on the basic building. It was more for they that those issues were included but they were not necessarily but, but they were a part of a much larger vision for the building. The library is asking for maintenance, basic maintenance of the building that will preserve all of it. You know, if you've got leaks coming down from your ceiling, that's going to mess up a whole bunch of stuff going forward and make, make many things difficult. So we don't know about the $20,000 grant at this point. What is the date that we get that information? Uh, um, whatever the panel is at the state level that makes that determination meets this month. I'm not sure exactly when that happens. So hopefully soon. Could I ask some questions, Trini? Sure, go ahead, Pat. 
um, some of the figures we got previously, it looked like it, the cost jumped from roughly 160 to 200,000 to replace the glass that was broken. Was there more that brought it up that much than just that? So really that's kind of a contingency. It's because of the nature of the project, it's hard to say what a contractor is going to uncover once the rolled copper sheathing is removed. Um, and as you all know, the cost for materials and for labor has gone up. So in the time that I've been pursuing funding uh, for this project, I, all we've seen is increases. So that's that's kind of our best. Um, is there any chance of other grants? Is that basically the only thing that would apply, the one you applied for? I haven't found any other grants that are applicable. And is there any chance of the trustees allocating more from uh, Kimball Fund? Yes. Uh I don't know what the trustees would decide as a whole. Um, I know that you know that we are more than willing to support this as an endeavor, but the the funds that we have, like the McNair funds, um, we there's a broad swath of things that we need to do with those, Pat. You know that that meet the the requirements of the people who gave us the funds to begin with. I'm not sure I feel like we have the information to make this decision tonight. It sounds like we have a scope with a very high contingency value in it. We don't know if we have a $20,000 grant coming from the state or whether it will be what value the town will actually be asking to be committed here. And I believe that Pat is right, that there are other grants, there's foundations, there's a variety of things out there in the state that help pay for these things. Um, I have a question so for you. When, when we look at the fact that we only have a couple hundred thousand dollars in there and we have some other buildings that need work on them, um, I think, you know, when we look at this, if we don't know what the scope is or close to what the cost is going to be, or other funding sources to it, we could be asked to commit almost the entire fund that's sitting there to do this project. Leaving Trini, the other buildings. Trini, may, I, may, may I ask a question, please? Sure, Tom. Um, uh, Robin, you suggested that there were contingencies or uh, I don't know if they rose to the level of restrictions on the McNair dollars, but can you speak to what those um, contingencies might be with respect to that um, bequest? I, I do not think that the bequest was intended solely to fund one project, Tom. Um, I think that that there were a number of, I, I would don't know that I would describe them as contingencies rather than intents. Um, that the, you know, the intents of the money, the intent of the money that was left is relatively broad. Um, mm -hmm. The trustees know that the building is part of that. Um, but but I don't think that the, I, I think if we go back and look at the the money and the, the requirements around the money, I do not think that fixing, absorbing all of the cost of fixing the cupola would be within the spirit of that money. <laughs> There's a lot that the library has done with that, you know, um, particularly during COVID, um, to continue its services and outreach mm -hmm. to the community and its service to the people that that re need us, right? You know, right, and yeah. need the services that the library provides. So, I would like to um, ask, I guess, in what regards the library has, um, I guess, why there's a different expectation 
about repairs to the library than there is, say, to repairs to the pool. Um, and last, I mean, I could be, I'm speaking from ignorance, and I will admit that. I'm not aware that Heidi did fundraising or grants um, or did a capital campaign in order to see that the pool was prepared. Um, so I guess I'm wondering why the library, the expectation on the library is different. I think there's a big difference there, Amy, in that um, the pool is part of a recreation program, which is managed by the town completely. The library is not managed by the town completely. It has a select, it has its own board. It has uh, funds that have been given to it to help in a variety of ways. And it's eligible for a lot of grants that other infrastructure is not eligible for. So there are some recreation grants out there. They're a little bit different. All we're doing is trying to figure out is have we looked at all the possibilities for grant funds and other ways to pay this besides putting it on the property tax of the people that have property in Randolph? So I would like to make the point that if the library is completely under the control of the town in that the, the voters and Randolph elects the library trustees just the way they elect the select board. So this is not, you know, a private foundation. This is not a private nonprofit. Um, we are a municipal entity. Just because there is a separate elected board that manages the, the library does not um, mean that this is not a, a, a municipal department. So I. Sometimes I think um, that even after more than 20 years that the library was pulled back under the town umbrella um, before my time, it operated as though it were an independent entity. It's still, it's, it feels sometimes like that narrative still hasn't shifted. So I don't mean to hammer on this, but we're a municipal library. So we belong fully and entirely under town government with a separate elected board. And I would I would I would echo that and say that it is substantially different. Well it is different from entities like the town pool and the recreation department and all of that. It is also substantially different from what Chandler was historically. Um, the Chandler Board of the the Chandler Board, which I joined, I can't even remember how long ago, um, was different from the board that maintained the building, and it the merge to have those two groups come together was dicey and happened at about the time that the building was in such disrepair that they needed to do something. I. I think that the town would not like to see the library hit that space of, of disrepair. Um, but it's, you know, it's a town building. And, and I think we, we have an obligation to maintain it. We do not ask the town for a lot in relative to, you know, outside the regular budget. Um, we maintain the department, you know, our our department funds fairly well, you know, pretty well, I think. Um, this is a need. I don't think anybody's denying that it's a town building. What we're saying is, or what I'm saying is, I don't believe we've researched and looked at all the funding opportunities that are out there to know that this has to come back onto the tax dollar. I believe there's other grants out there and that we should be looking for those uh, and researching them, looking at some of these foundations that invest in these types of buildings and seeing if we've really e exhausted opportunities to come back onto the town dollars. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I have a lot of faith in Amy's ability to research those opportunities. Um, but if that is the direction of the board, you know, I don't know what else we can do about that. Um, I would and only point out that the longer you wait, the bigger the damage comes. You know, the, the cupola is leaking. Um, and so that spreads down into the rest of the building. And so if we don't do something soon, then the cost of it, aside from inflation and all of that, the cost of that is just going to increase. Amy and Robin, is this something we can decide in January and you know at that point whether you have the grant or not? Does it have to be decided now? Um, you know, just for the sake of closure and knowing whether we can go ahead with the project, of course, I would like a decision tonight, but it sounds like there are enough questions you know, for some of the select board members that we, we will bide our time at that. I would encourage the board to look again to see if there are other options that might be available to take care of some of the funding. Who bids this project and oversees the work? So because of the nature of access to the area, the plan is for it, it, it's not being bid, it's an assessment, right? So it's based on an estimate by Keith Schumacher from Watershed. And he assessed the, the condition of the people. When we have the funding secured, then we'll have the opportunity and we'll have to be in the position to um, RFP it, invite contractors in to come look it over because it will require hiring a lift truck for them to get up there to put together their proposals and make a decision with guidance from historic preservation list. So I think and I'd so like to add something here. I mean, okay. given the time of year, the unlikeliness that we're gonna find anybody who's gonna work on this before spring, I think I we probably at this point, you know, I, I don't see any reason to believe that we wouldn't have some time here to discuss this a little further in January, because it's pretty unlikely you're going to find any contractor that's going to put, you know, a new cupola on there here between now and say May. So it seems like we've got a little time to research all these opportunities, you know, is there, is there more grants, you know, maybe that could happen. So you know, I think it's, you know, I think it'd be kind of prudent here to just like put this not on the back burner, but just set it aside for a month or two to kind of see where, you know, things could go. And by then you may know whether or not we have this other grant and maybe there's some other opportunities. I, I'm not sure. I think, you know, Trini could be right. There could be some foundations, you know, the Vermont Community Fund I know has done projects like this in the past. So I'm assuming that you reached out to those kind of things and I'm not, saying that you haven't, but I'm just wondering if there aren't some other opportunities here. And like I said, given the name of the project, I don't think we're gonna be able to start any construction until spring. And Amy, before you respond, I'm having a hard time understanding you. I'm wondering if you're a little bandwidth challenged and if it might help if your video is off while you speak. I've been is that better? Yep. Great. Now. All right, I guess I would like to hear clearly from the board what, what your pleasure is um, as a group relative to this. I'd like to understand better what the scope is and what a good estimate is of this um, and then look at, once we know what that is, also know what the project delivery model is for this. Um, you know, if it's a town building and the town should be paying for it, it should go through the same process as the rest of our town buildings go through. Indeed. Uh, and not be, which means it goes, you know, gets bid out by Trevor and we oversee it as we would any other town building. 
but I also want to see us looking at other funding that might be available to help pay for this. You know, the historic folks just got a huge slug of money through the HUD bill. Um, so there's a bunch of, there's all kinds of opportunities out there right now with funding for different pieces, parts floating around. So I think there's opportunities out there that may not have even been out there a few weeks ago. That's possible. That's that's good to know, Jamie. So if you see any of those opportunities, could you please send them my way? Yep, they just came out from the League of Cities and Towns. Fun, funding for work on historic buildings is often kind of fussy. Um, so yeah, I, I think sending that to Amy would be super helpful. Um, so that she could at least look at it and see how it, you know, see if there's anything that wasn't available before. When does the board come back to you? With, does the library come back to you with this? How long will it take the library to put it together? Our next meeting is in January. I think Perry's correct that you're not going to find a contractor that's going to get up there in the winter months. I, um, somebody might. Frankly, I, don't, I don't think it's. I think finding a contractor who's willing to come out to go up there and provide us with a detailed scope of work. I, I don't think anybody is going to be willing to do that, which is why the model that I'm looking at incorporates um, the bidding process with with developing the scope of work. So you're doing a design build build uh, design bid build project. I don't know that that's really an accurate um, description of doing repair and restoration for historic building. So Amy, have you sat down with Trevor to make sure this new model you want to do and how you want to do this is compliant with the town's procurement policy? So for projects over, I believe, $10,000, we have to RFP it. Right, but do we have a, I don't believe we have a design bid build policy for the town. Well, it's certainly worth me looking back at the procurement policy, but I don't require there being, I don't remember there being a requirement to have a detailed scope of work before putting a project out for RFP. Well, you got to have something to base your bidding on and on and your evaluation on. Yep, absolutely. And you got to know what your scope is to be able to get a, an estimate. So. Well, it is. It is, after all, a request for proposal. Um, and I think an important, actually a vital part of this is going to be hiring the right historic preservationist to help us make the best decision about the scope of work proposed. Maybe it's more than a one-step process. It sounds like you need somebody to come in to help you design what the scope of work is and then bid it out for a contractor that can do that work. Because whoever does your design of your scope is probably not going to be also doing the work. Well, I'm, I'm, I've settled on this process um, based on guidance both from the Preservation Trust and from the Division for Historic Preservation. Um, they certainly have way more experience than I do about how best to go about getting the right work done the most effectively. I am I'm not a project manager by training. I'm only a project manager by necessity. And this project is certainly different from any of the others that I've done at the library. So I lean very heavily on the expertise that's available from the Preservation Trust and the division. So my concern is that I'm hearing a lot about what you have done and what the board of the library has done, but I'm not hearing very much about how you've interacted with 
uh, town hall and the rules and requirements of the town for procurement and all that. So I think we got some work to do there to to sync those two up also because the those have to be you if you're a town building and you want the town to pay for it and it's a town project it has to follow town policies and and procedures um so i think this is a project that's not going to get a decision tonight i think it's got some ways to go some information that's needed um and you know we've got a, a full agenda i think the best thing to do is for there to be a discussion between Amy and Trevor on how to how to move forward with this project, how we scope it, what it looks like, what the steps are, and then looking at other funding sources to figure out how we maximize available funds out there without coming into the town's reserve. Did I miss that any, by anybody? Anybody have any other questions they'd like answered on that before it comes back? Hearing none, I will also offer that when you're having those conversations, if you'd like me to be part of them, I will make time available rather than just put all the demands out and not be willing to help you. Thank you. Thanks for that, Shani. And again, if you run across the particular HUD projects with preservation grant money available, please do point me in the right direction. Okay, I'll find that ARPA email that I got the other day and ship it off. Great. Thank you for your Great. Help. All right. Thank you. Trini, can I just say, just say that I think we all want to get this project done? Is something that needs to happen and I think we all want to get it done but in the best way that works for everybody. Agreed Pat. Then let's see what we can do shall we? Sure. Next up we have a okay. discussion about a sustainability coordinator idea and before we start this conversation I just want folks to know we got a lot of data that came to us at the 11th hour. And I don't know if everybody else had time to read them all, digest them and try to figure it out. So um, another topic that I don't believe we're headed to a decision point tonight, uh, but just more of an understanding of what the request is and what the potential options are uh, and how we move forward doing some type of a evaluation um, and you know, try to come to what works for the town. Um, and so with that, um, I'll let Trevor kind of give the background of it and we'll see what we can hammer out tonight. Yeah, I, I think that there's that broad summary of, um, this was an idea that came up this time around, at least through that work session in November. It was in there with some of the other options, such as the weatherization elements and a few others. And then at that point, it was talked about kind of in concept. And one of the, one of the needs is to better refine what the scope would be, um, even to, to get a little farther down the road of making a decision of what, when, how. Um, there's a lot of of, I think I'd refer to it as meat to put on the bone at that point, and, and that still needs to be done. I think there's a lot of um, folks uh, heading in different directions, trying to collect different pieces, and at some point, those disparate efforts, we should probably start to pull together into one coordinated um, framework so then we can evaluate what is there a model that is best for Randolph? What is that model? What does it take to get it done? So this is intended to be a general conversation about um, do we want to explore this idea? What are some of the things we'd want someone in this position to do? What are some of the models um, that we may have already heard about that we want to consider running down and really start to fill in the details as to how they work? 
you're talking about a multi-town coordinator, there's a few different ways to do that from the existing models like the expanding, say, the Two River program in some way by, I don't know, adding another coordinator at that level, something that we run uh, a little more on our own, which requires interlocal agreements, for example, um, uh, some of those pieces. And, and knowing what some of the options are will help us better refine what it is you're making a decision on or pitching to voters to make a decision on. Um, right now, I think there's a general sense of this could be helpful um, across a variety of ways to, um, to, to implement some projects that might be out there. And so knowing you know, what those are, what this would take, what it entails, and then we can start to fill it out so it looks less like, um, it's like a snap together skeleton kit that's still in the box. We know we want to build something from it, but all the bones are, aren't labeled and they're still in the box. We're gonna to start to snap it together so it looks like a body um, that we can then maybe animate and move forward. Okay, Tom. Trini, yeah, uh, uh, just to, to update people on what I um, committed to at the, the uh, meeting that, that Trevor just referenced with the Energy Committee uh, the middle of last month, I did reach out to uh, Peter Gregory at T Rourke, T R O R C, to uh, try to learn a little bit more about how the seven town work that uh, their staff member, Jeff Martin, is doing on um, uh, in an energy coordinator role, how that was working and how uh, we might be able to put together a three town or potentially if we rolled Bethel into it, a four town um, collaborative effort to work with T. Rourke on, in an energy um, coordinator role. Um, he suggested, first of all, Jeff Martin, who is currently serving in that capacity with now seven towns in the T. Rourke um, uh, coverage area, uh, is presently on family leave. So um, uh, his role is a little bit diminished by that right now while he's on family leave. Um, what, what Peter suggested to me is that we get some consensus among the three or four towns that might be interested in moving forward with some kind of energy coordinator uh, relationship with T. Rourke, that we, we uh, get agreement on that. And then he agreed that it made sense to set up a meeting with the T. Rourke staff between representatives of the four towns to talk about what that relationship might look like and how it might mirror uh, the seven town relationship that T-Rock currently has via Jeff Martin um, uh, moving forward. Um, the, the, the information that we received today through Gary Durr uh, via Stephen Bauer at t Rourke that Trini just referenced a few moments ago, uh, sheds a good deal more light on what that seven town relationship looks like and how we might model that moving forward. The, the concern or the, I, I don't know that I would raise it to the level of a concern, but the, the um, I think Randolph's interest needs in this needs to be, how can we move forward the most expeditiously? And is a four town relationship the way we want to go or do we want to possibly explore a relationship with T-Rourke that initially just focuses on providing energy coordinator, um, an energy coordinator role to, to Randolph, and then maybe broaden it to the other three communities as we move forward or what. But in any event, t -Work is willing to convene a gathering of uh, interested towns to lo look at some kind of um, energy coordinator role flowing through T work to us moving forward. I think the other option here, Tom, is to contract for the service. And so the ideal position is for this person to work themselves out of a job. Uh, mm -hmm. if, when you hire an employee, then you would either need to do it as a limited service position. Right, so it has an expiration date mm -hmm. or as a temp type position where it's like, well, you know, we'll use you until we don't need you anymore. 
or you contract with somebody to actually do certain tasks for you, you know, in a scope of work with deadlines and deliverables and all that. I honestly think contract, the type of work we're looking for here, if I understand correctly, is for somebody to come in and look at efforts the town could undertake. Uh, so they're defined tasks, you know, whether it's completing an energy audit of our buildings or using ones that have been done already, you know, um, looking at, you know, heating fuels, what are we doing there, those type of topics. But it seems like they're pretty well defined deliverables that we're looking for this person to do uh, on the scope of for the town, um, which could be high, you could hire somebody in so they have a deadline and you control that a little better. So I'm not sure what the best model is. And that's some of my concern here is I haven't really seen a scope of what we're looking to get out of this effort. Trini, I, I went with Gary Durer to the Braintree Select Board meeting the other night to throw out some information and talk with them, making sure they knew it was just the Energy Committee talking with them and not committing the town to anything. They seemed positive, um, wanted more details, but when the more we talked about it, their chairperson, Megan O'Toole, made the comment that uh, I think Randolph could have enough work for a person to do in just Randolph. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the more I've got looking at this position myself, I think it could easily be a full-time position. Mm -hmm. The area Where is that? that? Where is that list of, where's the list of work? Where's the job duties that we want this person to do? I mean, we've seen these other job descriptions for other entities, but where's the Randolph list? What do we want somebody to do in Randolph? What are the goals? What are we trying to achieve with this? You know, it's easy to say, oh, they have one and we want to do something similar, but kind of where's, I haven't seen the framework of of what we actually want out of this, other than looking at what other people have. And, you know, I'm, if you haven't picked up yet, I'm very specific to what Randolph needs. Like, what do we need? What are we trying to get out of this? And what's our best way of achieving that? Yeah, well, I can speak for myself. The three areas that I'm looking at are weatherization, transportation, and um, generation. And I think it should be both what the town buildings need, which is just town buildings, town equipment. It's just, a, that's just a small part of what the whole community needs, I think. I think we, we as a town should be responding to not only what our buildings need, but also what we can do for the taxpayers in the town so that they're more energy conscious and we need the state requirements that are coming up. It was interesting, Megan O'Toole works for the Agency of Natural Resources, which I didn't know, and apparently is involved in um, climate change issues through that agency. Um, I think there's plenty to do. We're in the preliminary part of defining what that is, but I don't, think that rules out doing it just because we don't have it defined at the second meeting that we've talked about. Uh, Trini, if, I'm, if I may react to that, um, I, I think we need, and I said this at the, at the um, Energy Committee meeting, joint meeting that we had uh, last month, I think we need to be careful at biting off more than we can chew all at once. Uh, for lack of a better way to put it. And I, I think if we focus initially on what we can do in town-owned building, buildings and facilities to achieve better energy efficiency, um, uh, 
that should be the first phase of our, our, our focus. And then moving on to assisting residents of the community with moving in that direction should be a second phase. But I don't think we should swallow this, this issue whole. And, um, and I, I would suggest that anything we put forward to an energy coordinator, whatever that position might look like, and however we might define it, if we choose to do so moving forward, that we focus first on achieving energy efficiency in town buildings, and then uh, and and then move forward with a broader agenda. I agree with that, Tom, completely. And that's part of my issue of of hiring an individual just for the town of Randolph, and that. And I don't doubt if we said to somebody, your job is to go out and get everybody to get off fossil fuels and weatherize their house and go you know, put solar panels on every so many square feet that they have, that would take a full-time person. My, uh, my challenge with this is that we're not going to be able to take it all on at once. And how do we do something so we can show successes and get people so that they're interested and wanna participate? If, we just keep cramming it at people, we're gonna get the same reaction we are today. So, you know, I think the multi-town model is good. I think the two rivers model might be, is worth looking at. And I also think the contracted model is worth looking at um, where we define what we want, how we get it, a date by which we get it. Um, and have some level of control over what that looks like. I, I will say that Peter Gregory, when I talked to him at TROC, did suggest that um, they might be open to a one town model. Uh, they also, he also said that, that um, they would be open to a multi-town model. So they might be one of the entities we wanna reach out to, whether it be with an RFP or whatever. Um, uh, I, I mean, Jeff Martin was the former energy at, at TROC was the former edge energy coordinator uh, for the town of Hartford. And so um, he has significant experience at the individual municipal level in, in, in this en energy coordinator role. It, 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 um, it, it, it seems like at least TROC should be part of the mix, at least in terms of our considering this. Um, I totally agree. Um, and I think there's some contractors. I think we have some individuals in town that have done some work on this type of stuff that might be interested in coming in in some limited scope, whether it's as a contractor or, you know, the state we hire limited service positions. So it's a you know, an employee, but it has a, a sunset date or a, you know, task oriented position that when the tasks are done, they're done. Um, you know, I think, I think there's different models and I'm wondering how we get to that. So do we get to a menu of options of, for the select board to decide on with using a, maybe a, a member or two members of the select board and a, a member or two of the energy committee to put us together a comparison of, you know, this is the type of work we wanna get done. Here's phase one, here's phase two. Here's our options of how we could do it. This is what it would look like. You know, if you hire an employee, this is about the wages. This is the benefit package. This is the cost of that. Or you can go with a contractor or two rivers would look like this. You know, I'm. I think there's there's a lot of options. The data that we got, the job specs were good um, that we got. They're generic, you know, they're not really, you know, sort of what does the work scope look like for Randolph? You know, even if we go and merge with some other towns, we still must know this is what we want somebody to achieve in Randolph. You know, Gary, isn't there a energy audit that's been done of the town buildings? Uh, there was a, par partial, a partial uh, one done a, a number years ago, uh, years ago. Um, and uh, 
when we were at a meeting with Pat and myself and in, uh, in, in the Braintree uh, group, they they did a full one several years ago, and they've already acted on it. They have solar panels on on town buildings, and they've done some insulating work. So they've really done a a, a, a good job. Um, and they are, um, I don't know if I'm repeating myself, but they wanted to meet with these other, other three towns. Um, there was two other actions the Energy Committee took from the, uh, the meeting on November 18th. Um, one was to get a hold of these other three towns, uh, which Susan largely did with, with my help. And I had the action to get a hold of uh, ultimately uh, Hartford to see how they uh, uh, generated their action plan. Susan, could you comment on, is there a question, Tom? No, 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 go ahead. Susan, do you want to comment on the, the towns you contacted? It, just well, a minute before that happens, Susan, oh. just a second. So we don't have a full audit of all our buildings. Correct. Is that what I understand? There's like a partial. <laughs> So we don't even know what the scope is of what we want somebody to do. Correct. Correct? Correct. So maybe we're way ahead of ourselves and what our first item ought to be is to find somebody that could come in and do an actual audit of, of our buildings. Correct? Well, Efficiency Vermont will, will do a walkthrough visit and if it's required, and it probably will be, they, they will recommend someone to do a full audit i don't think we want to stop with them i mean they're not going to give us the level of detail we need i think we need to look at if this is what the direction we want to go then i think we need to bring somebody in that's going to do an actual audit and give us a task list <clears throat> well well they would recommend efficiency vermont will recommend someone to do a full audit trini i i just want to point out that if you look at the the trorc model uh, that Jeff Martin is implementing for the uh, Intermunicipal Re Regional Energy Coordinator position there. Each of those seven towns um, has a totally separate agreement with t -Rourke in terms of the level of services that are being brought to them um, and so on. So, so um, I think we need to consider that in the mix of, of uh, describing what we want as well. Um, so some of my concern, Tom, is that I have received a fair amount of comments and calls about this to say, if we're going to hire another person in the town, is this really where the highest need is? When our roads didn't get graded this year when they should yep. have, and we have, you know, they there's a list of issues. And so I'm not sure that I'm at a place where... I understand the, the, the scope of what we want somebody to do for us. And I'm convinced that that need is much higher than some of the other needs we have to mm -hmm. potentially add staff to the town roster. And I haven't got my head around the, the duties and the deliverables enough to know that that's really an employee position versus maybe two rivers should be adding this on and putting an allocation out to their member towns like they do their dues to achieve this for all their towns? Or is it a scope of work that we put out to bid and hire somebody as a contractor to come in and do for us? Mm -hmm. That's where my struggle is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, how do you balance all that? And I just don't feel like we have the, information and the I don't anyway to understand what really what's there and that I can justify that this is the highest need for the town for an employee or that type of mm -hmm. that's where I've mm -hmm. got a little disconnect and I'd like to say right now that um, <clears throat> I agree that the I think our first step um, like Tom was saying earlier about having this be a, a, a position that would address the town building needs first and then look at expanding it to the rest of the town. I think that that makes sense that we really keep this as limited for now. There's plenty of work to do with just town facilities. 
Um, but I would also want to say that I think there's a real difference between this putting money into this as to putting into money into other town positions in that, um, you know, one of the one of the um, pieces here is that this position really ought to pay for itself. And, and so, you know, we should be saving money while we do this. And I think because of that, that does um, make it a higher priority than maybe some of the other things that we would love to spend money on. Um, if, if we really saw um, sig significant returns on our investment here, I, I think that would be make, would make it really worthwhile for us to move ahead on this pretty, pretty aggressively. Um, but I'd like to see more about what, what those numbers look like to, to see if that really does make sense. The other opportunity that is there, Larry, is to structure a contract for those services by which if we're gonna save all this money, the person gets paid by some ratio of how much they save the town in actual dollars. Well, so there's I, I did get a hold of Hartford and I talked to Lori Hirschfield there and she is leads the planning department and all the work in Hartford uh, was done under her, her planning department. And she started over a decade ago with your very point. Say, how can we put out this contract and save money? Uh, she got some free, uh, free um, solar panels through Nor Norwich Solar. That led to saving this money. Next year, she had another pro. So over a decade, she built up confidence that, that through saving money, that they ultimately signed the select board uh, signed in, in Hartford a deal that uh, they will be to, by 2027. The town will net be net zero emissions in, in, in the whole community by 2030 by saving hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's how they win it, and I, that's what I propose we do. Let's let's, let's figure out the few. The, what are, first, I think we really need an audit, <clears throat> a full audit. Uh, and, and, and then uh, figure out what we need to do and how much money we can save. And, and that saving is calculable. So we're not gonna solve this tonight. I think we've put forward quite a few items to think about. Do we have a couple members of the select board and a couple members of the energy committee to get together? And bring us back a matrix or a better look at this or how would folks like to move forward with this find with well, the energy committee i i think the the first thing to do is clearly to get a full scale uh by whatever means possible a full scale audit done energy audit done of all of the town-owned buildings so that we have some real data to base our next moves on um, and I Gary I don't know what you know you've indicated that there have been partial audits done but I think the first thing we need to do is get to full audits and really learn about the scope of, uh, uh, oh, of yeah. what we're trying to tackle here absolutely so Tom should we test Trevor with um, getting somebody on board? to do those audits for the town? Or they're gonna have to procure it, hire somebody, get them in here. I mean, I don't believe there's anybody out there waiting to do this for nothing. Well, yeah. you can call up Efficiency Vermont and ask for they're their help. They're just gonna point us to somebody, Gary. They're gonna point us to a con contractor that we're gonna have to pay, but we still gotta procure it according to the town's policy. And so I'd like to just see Trevor Okay. Work on that. And he needs to, you know, he can coordinate with the energy committee. He can do whatever's needed to do it. But I, I agree that until we know yeah. volume and the. Sure. Yeah. Trevor, do you happen to know if through VLCT there might be a, um, you know, a kind of a recommended group of potential edit edit energy auditors that we could um, conceivably reach out to or perhaps to energy uh, efficiency Vermont? I, I, yeah, I think we'd like to structure it in. We do, we go out there and try to I think, grab some of the um, 
energy audit RFPs that have already been done in other places, um, turn one into, into sort of our own model that's focused mm -hmm. on less building type mm -hmm. stage, some of the things we can throw in there. And then we'd look to do sort of two pieces to that. One would be kind of a general posting, hey, we've got this project going on. The other thing we might look to do is to get a, a list of, of contractors from somebody like an Efficiency Vermont. I don't if the league does it, it's something they've added fairly recently, but Efficiency Vermont's list of contractors, and then we'll sort of invite anybody on that list more directly. So we've covered both sort of the open ones, which are also um, you know, probably likely to appear in that contractor list too, but we'll hit it from both mm -hmm. ends. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had pretty good luck with responses for everything that we've had to bid out that way from paving on through the to the tax anticipation note for example so mm -hmm. we, we would use that model and and not look to reinvent the wheel because i've seen the audit rfp so we look to, to find one from somewhere that we could then adapt um, that, that matches our policy and, and has a nice structure to it in terms of what we need so Trini, are are you looking for a motion here to direct uh, Trevor to uh, formally start exploring um, energy audits across the board in terms of town-owned buildings? Sure. I, I will make such a motion. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second on the table. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No time for comments. <laughs> oh. No discussion. I have a comment. Ah, you didn't I'm raise happy. it. So we were I'm moving. happy to clam. That's my comment. All right. So did you have a comment, Pat? I did have one. Um For it. I agree with Larry and Tom that yes, we start with the municipal buildings looking at those, but we've been doing that off and on for 15 years and haven't got anywhere. So I'd like to see plans, at least for the longer term, to have a more concerted effort to really get some things done. Um, looking at town buildings is great, but that's just a start of what we need to do, I think. Understood, but the town buildings is what we control. We can't mandate businesses. We can't mandate individuals. Nobody's so talking about sometime. that. Yeah, well, sometimes you got to do it through leadership. That's yeah. Sometimes we have to do it through leadership and showing that this is a focus and here's the benefits of it. And, you know, I would hope that once we know what the audit shows and what work we have to do, that we won't just sit quietly, do the work and keep it stifled. We ought to be announcing it. You know, here's the efforts we're undertaking. Here's the amount we've saved. Here's the the impact of the decisions we've made based on the data we've gotten and the changes that we've undertaken. Also, I, I think uh, to address your concern, Pat, uh, on an interim basis, at least, while we work through this process specifically mm -hmm. relative to town controlled and owned buildings, the Energy Committee can continue to pursue its publication, uh, public education efforts and so on relative to what residents can do to uh, make their homes, et cetera, more energy efficient, looking at converting to pellet fired boilers, whatever it might entail. The Energy Committee has embraced that role and there's no reason they can't continue to move forward with this while we tackle the issue of town-owned buildings and get them on board. And then let's get that done. And then we can move on to what we can do to assist um, residents with their own endeavors moving forward. So it's gotta be an incremental, it's gotta be an incremental approach. We just don't have the resources, the, the, the funding, the resolve right now for it to be anything um, more than, than incremental. I agree with you, Tom. And but I think we we don't do a good job of sharing the information of our successes. We tend to just take them and run on to the next issue. So mm -hmm. some of what this topic is is changing behaviors and changing thought processes. So 
you know, we all tend to look at the, an issue and say, what does this mean to me? Or well, how does this impact me? So if we just do these changes quietly and go along, we're not publicizing anything for people to see, hey, you know, the town did this, they did an audit. They looked at the heating system in this building. It was costing them X, they changed it to this. Now it's costing them whatever, and they're saving this impact. Mm -hmm. So I have, I have a question, if, if that's all right. This is John Pemmetal. Um, so I imagine you have, uh, you know, two months from now, you have an energy audit in your hand. What, what, what do you do with it, with it then? Who's going to be the person or the individual or the entity to take that information and roll that into a, a, an executable project or plan to, to make improvements in the town? No, we've had we've we've had energy audits in our hands before, um, and evidently it hasn't gone anywhere. I I think the town should do as you recommended a few moments ago, Trini, is to get several individuals from the select board along uh, alongside the energy committee, and fully flesh out what the opportunities are with getting an energy coordinator either at T Rourke from which Randolph can can draw expertise or have one work within uh, Randolph itself and, and apportion the cost across the four towns that would be interested in, in, in getting expertise from that individual. Yeah, John, thanks. I think we need to get, I think you can do the energy audit in one of two ways. You can tell them, just tell me what you see or when we develop the scope of work for it, it could be an energy audit with action items. So, uh, you know, I'm all for letting a consultant do the work for me and give me what those action items are. What action items could Randolph take by building that would make improvements, you know, and what, and what are those? And then I think you got to get the energy committee and some select board members together to say, here's our goals, here's our priorities. Now, how do we do it? If we have a staff person, this is how it looks. If we have two rivers, this is how it looks. If we bid it out and have a contracted employee or consultant do it, this is how it looks. And so then are that you comes saying, back for the select board to make the decision on which way we go forward. So are you saying that you don't think um, it's worth pursuing this energy coordinator um, model at this point? I think that we don't know what we would have them do at this point because we don't know what the results of this energy audit are. I think you're right. We've done partial energy audits of buildings hit or miss over the years, but we've also done improvements and done some work on those buildings. So I don't believe we have an actual list of what the duties are or what act, you know, what items we would want somebody to do because we don't know what we need. Actually, we do have a list and, and, and Gary has that list and it's based on the job description for the individual, the energy coordinator at t -Roar. And it's, it's, so it, have, it's actually it, it quite um, robust and, 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 and quite um, encompassing. So we have a list for the town by building of what we want to achieve. No, nope. we have a list of what this individual could do for the town, which would include conducting an energy audit, putting together a plan to then make improvements within the town, working with the town entities to 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 make sure that these plans move forward and don't and don't die on the vine. Uh, Trini, what I did is I took uh, the information uh, of the job description. Actually, he uh, worked worked from with, with T. Rourke. And I can read off quickly, you know, a few things under yeah, physical process. So, uh, Gary, I think that's the data we got at the 11th hour today. I've summarized and, it. I summarized. still believe, yeah, so um, we've spent a lot of time on this topic and the board has voted to do an energy audit of all of our buildings to get that right. information. And we're moving forward with that. And then I, I, I believe the discussion went in the direction that we needed that information and then to look at what the different models were we could move forward with to achieve what comes out of that audit. 
Fine. And so unless there is a select board member here that would like to take this in a different direction than we just voted on, I'd like to move on to the next item. And not hearing any, I'd like to thank everybody for that conversation. Uh, and hopefully we'll get uh, RFP out and get an energy audit going and the energy committee and select board can continue to work forward to figure out what we need to do with our town buildings. And then if there's a scope bigger than that, what that looks like and, and how that moves forward. Thank you. Next up is a discussion on budget committee, the timeline and the process. Yep, you folks had asked me to just map it out really quickly at one of our previous meetings. So we sent a memo out. Uh, today, and I apologize for the late delivery, but it's pretty simple, straightforward one, looking at the process for committee expansion from three to five members from, I think it was the year before last, um, you know, basing this same effort on that. What we would do is at that first meeting in January, bring essentially what the, the two articles would look like that you need. The first one is the one that authorizes the expansion from the five to seven members, that 20 20 action to go from three to five included some other things in the committee scope so that if you wanted to to bake anything else in one of the ideas between going from five to seven is to bake in some of the capital budgeting review processes so that could be part of the article or it could just be kind of an implied piece of the workload that's left out of it but we'd be able to write that up for you so you'd see what an article would look like um, and then the second article that goes with it just after it would be to fill any vacancies. And so what you'd be looking at process-wise would be, um, there are two that expire, I believe, um, at the end of this year, and then there'd be two new ones if voters approved the expansion. And so we'd be looking for that. It helps to know, um, there's a question in that first bullet under the article. We had talked about a system where we go from five to seven, and then at some point, the two new members, um, essentially those positions expire after there's a familiarity with any new workload stuff and we, we go back to five, so it's whether or not you bake that in or you go up to seven and leave it there unless or until there's some other action. And really it would be that's how we build the terms depending on which way you go with that. Um, a little bit easier if you build it into a, uh, it stays at seven until acted upon, but I don't think it would be too hard to figure out either way which way to go. We put in there at this point, the deadline to warn town meeting for 2022 is January 30th. We'll probably have the warning set before then, I would imagine, to allow for time for any of the, the stuff that can come up as part of that process um, and to make sure that we're able to, to get it done as well as possible. And then you go on to town meeting. Um, it looks like it's a Saturday, February 26th. It's right on the outer edge of that three-day limit statute, but it still makes it. And then, um, uh, February 27th and beyond, if it's all approved by the voters, you've got a seven member budget committee that will assume some of those capital functions and then we can talk from there about what that meeting structure, what that budget timeline looks like. It's a good time to, to revisit maybe what, what that timeline is, what type of information the committee wants, presentations, any model changes we're after, um, that might be an opportunity to do that. Um, and when I say model changes, just in terms of the, they, the review process is something everybody's good with. We can stick with that if there are any changes to it. Um, we can make that, you know, if department heads are, are, are wanted on a particular evening, for example, um, to bring them in to talk about what they do operationally. Um, we may want to consider if there's some benefit in a joint select board budget committee conversation in the fall, say, that's about setting budget goals and priorities. And then everybody has had a, a discussion about which direction we want to head every year. Um, and we can build budgets with that in mind as well. Um, so we can identify some of these things to research with a nice long timeline. We're not racing up against any town meeting warning deadlines. So those aren't necessarily part of, of what we'll be doing for town meeting, but just some things to consider as we're, we're kind of caught in a natural transitional moment anyway, um, with or without the expansion. That's the basic timeline process. It's fairly straightforward. There isn't, there isn't too much um, in there. If we knew you were going to add it, um, if you wanted to put it in to the town report in some way as a, what's this article mean, what are we trying to do? Other uh, opportunities to, to maybe explain the idea if needed. We certainly have those available to us along the way.
I think I'd like to say that um, I think it's really premature to consider expanding the budget committee in regards to add the addition of possible capital planning duties. I, it seems like this isn't going to be a dramatic increase in the workload for the budget committee. And, for, and so first, I'd like to say that given that fact, um, I think it makes sense for the budget committee to, to see how it goes for a year um, and, and see if, if it really does increase the workload so much that it requires the addition of personnel um, rather than go through all this trouble. And, and the other thing is, you know, if, if, even if this does require a significant amount of work, it's, it's not clear to me that having additional members is going to make it less time consuming for budget committee members. <clears throat> um, it just seems like, you know, budget committee members are going to want to be involved in this process. And that means presumably all of them. And so it's just going to be more people spending, spending more time on some additional topics. It's, it's, it's not really clear to me how this is really going to help. Uh, so we have Jerry with us. Um, any thoughts on that, Jerry? Um, I'm sorry, there's a little background noise, but um, that was a lot to absorb, but it, it sounded like generally I, I get it and I think I am aligned with it all. I, I'm open to expanding to seven, but I think the goal should be to make it short term, make it a transitional thing. And I agree with Larry that there's not any guarantee or likelihood even from a process standpoint that we're going to be more efficient by trying to take on more people and do these additional duties. So I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. I think I've expressed that before. Um, it, it's my biggest reservation when I hear Trevor talking about it is how in the world are we going to explain this to the town? Who most of the people in the town, their eyes they glaze over just hearing the name budget committee. And you're talking about a pretty complicated process. <laughs> um, so a lot of it is is uh, how we sell this. And the only other concern I have is that um, I hope there's some way that those people who are on this budget, on the capital planning, committee currently don't feel disenfranchised, disgruntled, that they can participate um, for the first time running for office, which is intimidating for some. So it, it's a difficult thing to navigate for that. But sounds like you're on, the, on a very good track. And I thank you for it. So Jerry, to clarify, do you, you think that we should um, like we should add positions onto the combined capital planning and budget committee as a transition? So they would what? Maybe we have two, you know, uh, multiple positions end in a year, and only one of them gets one of the positions is up for reelection. How would we? How do you see that phasing? Um, I think I would suggest there's no need for it to be an odd number. I would su suggest that we create up two more positions that could be filled or may not be filled, depending on who runs at, at town meeting. So that it would increase it to seven and just have it a way that by attrition, there would only be five members starting in two years. We could always change that too, but that would be the plan. And so it wouldn't be that those specific positions ended, or well, maybe it would, but the, the, the point is that it would be through attrition. So Ideally. if I understand how we gotta put this out, we need to have, if we're going to say we wanna expand them, the town voters have to vote to expand the budget committee by two positions, right? From five to seven. 
and those positions would have to have terms on them that allow them to rotate into the election cycle. So I think we do have to say these positions are coming in, but they're going to be phased out if we don't want to stay with a seven member. I'm almost thinking either we stay with what we got and they can run for the seat and get them or not get them, or we expand to seven and allow them to run to take some of the additional positions but to have them be for a few years and then phase in and whatnot, I think is going to be pretty complex to explain. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's a bit cumbersome. You could make it a one and a two year position so they phase out it, not both at the same time. And they can be interchangeable with other members of the budget committee. Like right now in March, people from the capital planning could run for the two open seats. One of which is open and one of which is going to be a member who may or may not run. So is that a, uh, if we create two seats versus we have two seats that are one that's completely open and one that may or may not have an incumbent, aren't we giving kind of the same opportunity for members of the current capital planning committee to get on the budget committee as we would if we created more two positions specific for them? That's true if you discount the, 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 the power of an incumbent. So to the extent the incumbent is likely to win that would be against that argument, but you're you're exactly right, technically. So, I guess I, one of, one of the things I'd like to point out is that we we increased the size of the budget committee from three to five recently, um, and one of the big motivations for doing that was that the budget committee could have a quorum even if one or two people were still absent and. And, and get some and get some and just be able to get some work done even if they did have a quorum because three people is pre, is pretty small and if you you're missing one you've still got a quorum but if you're missing two then you can't uh, you, but if you only have two out of three members it's still hard to get stuff done anyway I guess um, um, making it making it five um, seems to solve that problem but if the bigger the committee you know now we're, we might start to get into that problem again where you know, we have trouble getting everybody on board to show up in a meeting all at the same time. The, the bigger the group, the harder it is to schedule meetings. Um, right now with the Board of Abatement, um, we've been having some really hard problems um, getting a quorum because the board is so big and we need a lot of people to show up just to get a quorum. So I think it's another thing to consider that um, the board can actually be unwieldy um, as, it, as it gets too large too. I'll agree with that because I think all these committees and all these different boards are struggling to find support and to get people involved. So I have my reservations about expanding it, but maybe it's necessary. So maybe the solution here is to expand the scope of the committee without expanding the membership, knowing that we have at least one seat it's going to be wide open, and another one that's up for either re-election or will be. Somebody's going to be a TV show or something in the back. Can, can I can I ask that whoever is uh, has all that background chatter unmute? I mean mute. Excuse that's, me. That, that's me. I'm on mute. Sorry. The conversation sounds like it's coming around to consensus that there are enough seats on the budget committee. Uh, and adding the duties of capital planning to this committee does impact another committee that we have out there, but those members would have an opportunity to run for at least two seats that are opening up on the budget committee. Is that sounding like the direction? I'm fine with that, Trina. Okay.
So either we need a motion from the board to go forward with having an item on the town ballot to expand the budget committee to seven and elect two new positions plus the two that will be up for election this year, or we're fine with the way the committee is now and changing the scope of their work to add capital planning to it, which is actually part of budgeting. Yeah, second option, I don't think requires you to, to do anything formal. So what's everybody's pleasure? I think we heard that Larry's in favor of keeping it the way it is and letting it roll, which requires no action tonight. Kind of siding on that one. Tom, Perry, Pat. I'm uh, in agreement with Larry. I am also. I'm okay with that. Looks like we're going to let it be the way it is, change the scope of the committee a little bit and let things roll. Sound good, Jerry? <laughs> All right, next up is to consider a Rotary Club sign application. Is Josh on or? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll handle it. We Josh is out today. We're not sure if he's going to jump on or not. Essentially, there's a proposal from the Sunrise Rotary to put two of the round rotary signs at different spots. Entry exit points, one on 66 by the Green Mountain Gospel Chapel and the other one on 12 over by, um, we've got the uh, current Randolph signage on the Castings property. The way the sign ordinance is written, um, requires the select board to weigh in on, on the design and these round signs are about 30 inches in diameter and the recommendation from Josh as our sign officer at the moment is to approve them but to try to make sure that the one on route 12 is co-located with the existing sign so that you don't have them cluttering up the area or, or or in blocks um, to the extent possible, and if not, try to try to co-locate them close together so they work in harmony. I think it's really about making sure they can both be seen. Are you in Sunrise no. too? So Sunny's here too and might know more about the, the rotary perspective on it. Um, I don't know if I missed anything from, from the application, so it's before you for um, approve the, the design and then the recommendation from staff is to, to require the, the installation either on the existing sign or, or as close to it as possible on the Route 12 end of things. It's uh, no cost to the town uh, and we'll do the installation. It's, it's the right price for us right now. <laughs> Any questions from board members? No. If not, I have a comment. I have a comment. It looks like yeah. it looks like the way our sign ordinance is written that any group of people could do this, right? Correct. Yeah, there's, there's no restriction. Right. Is that what we really want? To eight. I'm not yeah. just on this particular issue. But well, that's going kind of, forward, uh, is, that, is that what we want? Is people just putting signs We up? can't discriminate. We're not allowed to discriminate. That's why the new side harness is in place. So if anybody group wanted to do this, we had a lengthy conversation about this before we sent the sign ordinance off to the select board. And what you're reading or what you have for an ordinance was based on information that came from precedents that were set due to legal um, challenges to the sign ordinances. So we've adopted what was recommended to us. And so, yes, any group could request the same thing. I, I, I have a, a, a quick question. Um, uh, Sonny, Sonny, will this sign include um a time and date for when sunrise rotary meets it's not quite clear to me i've no, seen these i've seen these signs all over you know not just vermont but in other 
states as well where it might say, you know, Monday morning, 7 to 9 a.m. Uh, that's a good question, Tal. That's a good question. And uh, we decided not to put the uh, location and dates uh, along with the sign. One reason uh, most Rotarians now have an application on their mobile phones that tell them where the club meets. So if they come into town, they'll know exactly where to go. So we just did away with that extra sign down at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. And, and just to be clear, um, from, what, from what you've said, Perry, if, if we had a Kalanis Club or the Lions Club or the Eagles Club wanted to do this same thing, they could under the current, uh, under the current sign ordinance too, correct? Yeah, and there's there's a lot of discussion there about content neutral and things like that. But yes, that's that's true. Right, right. That's correct. I, I have a couple of questions. One is, um, under under what conditions um, can the select board decide that we that we don't approve a sign? Like, what what could we base that decision on? It sounds like, given our sign ordinance, perhaps we don't have a lot of leeway. Thoughts about that, Perry or? Trevor? <laughs> you want to take that, Trevor? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get to the side think, ordinance real quick. I mean, there's things, basic things like, you know, it can't be offensive. Okay, so you have to kind of look at that. But there's this, there's a lot that goes into this thing from the legal action standpoint here now where, you know, we, as the planning commission, we discussed this over, I think, four or five meetings to try to, to get full grasp of this. And I think at the time we might have actually asked to get some legal opinion on this. And so I think what, you know, what we have in front of us, and we as a select board adopted this, um, mm -hmm. you know, a while back here, uh, if those are questions you have, we should have asked them then. <laughs> because <how they're> gonna <laughs> go back and you're going to have to readdress this and, and rewrite this sign order. Yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we necessarily need to rewrite or revisit anything. I, I guess I just, from my own knowledge, I'm curious, like, you know what's what's the select board's real role here? We, we're we're tasked with with having to approve this, but what's uh, uh, you know upon what criteria could we say yes or no? Especially no. Like if we say yes, obviously then everybody's happy, right? But if we say if we were to say no, upon what basis? Like could we possibly do that if we wanted to? So a yes doesn't necessarily mean everybody's happy, right? Um, I said suppose it could not be. Um, and I don't know that there is criteria upon which to say no. I think if I read the ordinance right, it's pretty basic. Um, but I also believe there was guidance on this that came out of Two Rivers. Oh, yes. Um, for what we had to do. And, um, and so... There, not, normally, uh, Josh... Uh, as the authority to approve uh, signs, you know, as the, uh, the sign officer. And uh, why he sent it to the select board, uh, I, I really don't know, except that, uh, you know, it may be, may be a question whether it should be mounted uh, on the current uh, sign, you know, coming in from Mark 12 or uh, mounted separately. And maybe that's why he wanted to let the select board know that there could be a question there for the select board to uh, decide. Mm -hmm. As far as meeting the sign ordinance, it does meet the sign ordinance. Uh, right now, uh, we don't have any rotary sign at all uh, for this town. Uh, for all of Vermont, uh, almost every town in Vermont that has a rotary club has a rotary sign, you know, to tell the public that there's a rotary in town. Uh, Randolph is very fortunate, uh, except for Burlington, uh, in Rwanda, we're the only town that has two rotary clubs. So, so, so Sunny, is, is, that, is that really the whole point of the sign? It's just to basically announce to the, the world that there, there is a rotary club in town? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I guess the other thought I had was that if, if we are potentially opening this up to other groups wanting to put up their own signs, then I wonder if it makes sense to mount this sign on the existing sign. Because um, if, if other groups want to put up their own signs, then we're going to run out of space pretty quick. And I think that's part of what this is. Larry is looking for permission from the town because it's going to be mounted to a sign that the town owns. 
And there's a specific provision, just looking quickly, it's referenced in the, in the item form, but in 207 F1, um, these types of welcome signs um, come before the select board for approval of the design. So your hook comes through this pretty particular section for this type of sign when they're used as, as welcome or entry exit signs. Um, so I think Josh is pulling it from a later section of the ordinance, but looking back through it, there aren't really a lot of standards for um, here are the conditions under which signs won't be approved. There's some, some, you know, some of the standards related to dimension, location, some of those things. But I think if we got into a content type of, of issue, it may be looking back at that guidance from Two Rivers or BLCT or others, and then applying some kind of um, common sense standard. We'd almost, I don't know if anybody saw the article on license plates and vanity plates. Um, we might have to make a determination and in individual basis as to appropriateness, and then there's an appeal process in the ordinance that an applicant could avail themselves of um, along the way as well. So it's it's an imperfect model in that it's not as clear as, as here's what's a yes and here's what's a no, but there, there are some ways to navigate it for sure. Uh, if you look at other towns, uh, Northfield is a good example. They have their welcome sign uh, just after the gas station going into uh, Northfield, and just below on that same sign is, is a Rhodey uh, emblem. There's a lot of towns that will do that. I don't think you're going to have a lot of people rush in trying to put a, a sign on the current uh, welcome sign, you know, on Route 12. Uh, but, you know, that's my own, own opinion. And this is just uh, the emblem of Rotary, correct? Yeah, that's all. This isn't saying the Rotary welcomes you to Randolph. No, no, it doesn't. It'll be attached to the, so, uh, the side of the current sign and not on the sign. So I'm not sure that I agree with Josh's determination, and maybe I'm missing something, that this is a permit for a, a sign intended to identify or welcome, to the, welcome the public to the town. Yeah, it probably hinges on the... the the first part of the sentence, a permit for a freestanding sign, free sign intended to identify and or welcome the public to the town. But I guess, yeah, the later part of it makes it a little bit muddier. But aren't you identifying the town, not a club in the town? Well, yeah, I was going to say, if you read it, I think... In that case? Of, yeah, I can read it as a sentence where it's you're identifying the town. It, there's some other marker other than the civic group, and that's where it applies as opposed to applying it to a sign by a civic group at a, at a welcome point, if that makes any sense. And so, yeah, it gets into the interpretation of really that first sentence. I don't have any problem with this sign. I just... I'm not sure that it requires select board approval for him to put it up. It almost looks to me like Josh could have done it on his own. If because it it's freestanding, it's not being connected to our sign. If I read all this so, fine details right, Trini, there's there's two options: either either uh, put it uh, on the same sign as the welcome sign to Randall, attach it to the to the left side of that. Uh, the other option is to make it a separate sign away from uh, that sign. And, uh, would, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever the select board uh, would like us to do on that. I, uh, Trini, if I may, I, I, I think the better option is to attach it to um, kind of a common sign, because otherwise we open up the door for this proliferation of signs you know, whether it's the Lions Club or, as I mentioned earlier, the Kiwanis Club or any other fraternal organization in town, the Masons, whatever it might be, um, it kind of feels like, I mean, I don't mean to be flipping here, but if you think of a NASCAR, <laughs> right, they have all their logos on their car, right, and it's all there. I, I wonder if it doesn't make sense to consolidate all of these um, organizations such as Rotary. Uh, into a common welcome sign. They're thinking that would be adjacent to the welcome sign that comes in, right? 
Yeah, yeah cer certainly. But I, I, I just wouldn't want to see a proliferation of individual organizational yeah. signs getting. I don't, I don't think that's likely to happen, but you know, you could have a couple organizations here that might want to do that. So, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to having an, in, having, you know, having it on an independent post or structure adjacent to the welcome to Randolph sign. Yeah. So, you know, in my opinion is if the rotary is willing to construct something that allows some other signs to be on it, um, you know, I'd be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't necessarily know that we would get any other organizations that would like to do that, but in case we did, there'd be an opportunity there. Yeah. No. So. so I think if we're going to allow them to put it on the town sign, it requires a motion from the board. If they want to put up their own post with their sign, it does not require action of the board. Good. And we may have, in, in, sorry, Trini, in thinking about talking with Josh too, sometimes what we'll do when it's this type of language that could be conceived as a coin flip, if there's another entity to essentially at least whole about uh, which way to go with it sometimes we'll elevate it so it could be if it's unclear in the language we talked about this a while ago and it may have been we've had a few of those where it's headed to the pc or the drb or or to the select board just to say hey we're not necessarily sure what it is so let's take it to the next step in there and get some try to get some clarity and we all talk about it and agree the sign officer does it in this case and the select board does it in that case so it, it, if you go the other way it does give us the clarity too um, that sometimes we'll seek when the language is, is maybe not as, as clear cut. Yeah, I think you do have a little bit of an issue here, Trevor, because um, the land that this sign is on is in a, there is an agreement between the property owner and the town to allow the welcome sign there. Uh, so we probably ought to make sure that that also allows a rotary sign in that location. It doesn't say it's only for town of Randolph welcome sign or whatever. So okay. I, I think that's the first piece of it. I do believe that it's cleaner if the rotary sign is attached to the town sign for this one. And I don't believe we're painting ourselves into a corner where if six more come in, we can't say, okay, we now need to do something different and put up a different structure for those signs or to add something onto our sign to support that type of thing. So I, you know, the, probably the, the best way for us to handle this and not delay it is to um, take action that allows this to go on and be attached to the town sign as long as the lease that we have or the agreement we have with the property owner allows that. I'm fine with that. And then down the road, you know, if it becomes an issue, we can address multiple signs. And then we have to create a post. Right. To create a post okay. So that's good to me. I, I will make a motion that um, that we um, authorize this as it with attachment to the current town sign pending pending review of whether the lease agreement allows that. Second that. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up, we have to consider authorizing mailing postcards for absentee ballot availability for town meeting in 2022. This is a follow up to something else we did at the last meeting. We were talking at that point about whether or not to consider mailing the absentee ballots, but then in the discussion kind of uh, hit on the idea from, I think it was last year, about mailing the postcards that then talk about availability of the absentee ballot and can be returned to request one. That's the proposal that's before you today. Emery's here too, um, and can talk about it, uh, as well as the election officer. But the action item sheet sort of details that we would do the, the postcard system um, we paid for at this point, uh, unlike last year at this point, we'd be paying for the, the $3,000 to $3,500 cost, um, which would put us over budget in, in the postage line for that, for, for that particular department. Last year, the state did reimburse for those costs. Maybe something like that comes up, especially if, if case counts and some other variables continue uh, on a certain trajectory. We're in a 
back in a, a mode more similar to last year. We don't have that assurance or, or any sense of, of that happening, so this would be something we'd pay for, but it does improve that level of access um, uh, for folks who maybe can't make it um, uh, on the actual election day, and it does follow what we're doing. And then if it's the kind of thing that you want to go forward and do again this year, we've got an opportunity to then program this cost in for fiscal 23 and beyond. It can become kind of a standing operational um, cost that we carry in that particular line, and then we're, we're not sort of out of cycle again um, with that. I don't know if I missed anything, Emory, in that summary, but... Um, no, actually, well, you do have three options before you. There's sending out all absentee ballots, then there's the middle ground of postcards, or there's actually not doing postcards at all and focusing on advertising and saying that all they really have to do is call me and you can get an absentee ballot. I would recommend the middle ground of postcards. My predecessor estimated that sending out all absentees for town meeting day would be around 10 grand. That was a rough estimate, but it, it would be much cheaper to do postcards. Um, from what I recall from last year, people seemed to respond well to the postcards. They liked that. It was pretty straightforward to them all. Henry, do we have a sense of, of how many people requested absentee ballots via the postcard last time? We have an exact sense, in fact. All right. <laughs> there well, we know how many people created requested absentee ballots. We don't know if it was because of the postcard, right? Because that, some people don't correct. do it anyway. That is correct, yes. So there are 953 absentee ballots requested, 784 were returned, and a total of 926 people voted for town meeting day last year. So, so we don't know how effective the, the postcards were in terms of um, getting people to vote. No. If Joyce were here, she could talk about prior years, but I can't speak to that. Because to me, that would seem to be the, the critical piece of information, right? If we if we know that sending out postcards increases voter participation by some significant amount, then we might easily be able to justify the cost. Or if we knew for, well, conversely that, um, that it didn't um, affect voter turnout, then it would seem to be a waste of money. Um, it would seem like it would help us to make our decision if we had a little more information about that. I do know my predecessor said that uh, the number of, total number of people voting last year was commensurate to previous years. Just in person, about 900 people voted in person in years prior to COVID. I can say that about 100, a little bit more than 100 people voted in person, largely, I would assume, because most of those people voted absentee. So we have 900 dedicated people that like to vote, whether it's in person or by absentee. Yeah. About 25 to 30% of the registered voters in Randolph. I would have expected the outreach to have produced more voters. Yeah. Seems like given the years past, that's been about the number somewhere between 900 and 1100 or so. So. Yeah. I would echo Trevor's sentiments that we don't quite know what's going to happen in the next few months, COVID wise. I think that's the, the crucial question. I guess I'm not convinced that the postcards did anything to drive up participation. Hmm. I would have expected that number to be higher than what we've seen in prior year voting. Yeah, that would have been my expectation too. And I wonder if given the fact that we have other ways of reaching the public besides postcards if that, that don't really cost anything, such as through um, various Randolph-oriented Facebook groups and, and our front porch forum, um, whether that's you know the way to get the word out. I'm going to agree with you that on that. I think that that probably is just as effective and probably more cost effective than spending 3,200 bucks mailing postcards because you know we do have a pretty pretty strong group in the community who are our front porch farm readers. Um, lots, like you said, there's a number of different Facebook Randolph groups. So 
I think that we can effectively reach majority of those people. And I also believe that everybody who wants to vote knows how to get an absentee ballot and you don't necessarily need to prod them, so. Yeah, if, if it seemed like there was a really strong response to you know, the postcards in the, in the past, um, you know, if we all of a sudden saw a big jump in the number of people who were voting absentee on the year that we did issue the postcards, then that would seem to be good evidence. And, and if that number was big enough, it might be worth it. But given the fact that we did not see that, it's, it's, it seems hard to justify spending this money. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. So we could look to build then kind of a marketing model then and think about, you know, Front Porch Forum, a, um, even a newspaper ad is, is more cost effective than, than the 32 and gets a different kind of demographic. We've got our website. Um, the town report might provide an opportunity to do a little extra outreach, but we could, uh, could try to build around that, I guess, and think of some other ways to be out there. I think it did help that there was some universal mail-in balloting. People have gotten more familiar, comfortable. I think it's an excellent idea. If you could, that way. If you'd incorporate something into the town report, you know, maybe there's a, you know, goes on the front page, the, on a secondary page in there, or some little insert that could go in the town report that might be as effective. Okay. Sounds like we've identified other ways to do the outreach. Um, that's hopefully will get us a better. It would be nice though to have the data shortly after the election of, you know, going this other route and not issuing the postcards. What does that give us for turnout? You know, how many people, it would be nice to know shortly after the first part of March, uh, you know, maybe by the middle of March, how many people requested absentee ballots and how many people overall voted. So we can see if maybe reaching out this other way got the word out better and got more people to participate. It, it's also possible that the, that we had about the same amount of turnout, but they weren't the same people. Um, maybe there were folks who voted for the, you know, for the first time or who are infrequent voters who voted because they got a postcard and the people who would normally vote at, at town meeting, um, you know, who actually like to show up at the polls, maybe they just didn't didn't come because of the pandemic. Yeah, it's hard to know without actually running the the databases of the voters against each other. Yeah, well, Larry, if I may ask, has there been any? Um, do you have any scuttlebutt, or has there been any uh, preliminary discussion among? legislators as to whether they might continue the voting protocols that were in place for 20 and 21 or 21 especially in the coming year depending on what happens with COVID in other words doing away with town meetings moving to Australian ballot those sorts of things I haven't seen anything in recent months um, concerning voting Nothing. yeah yeah it, it, it feels like we're just, it's such a moving target right now with Omicron and Delta and you know, the, the surge in Vermont. Um, and, you know, it, it seems like it changes from week to week and who knows what we're going to be looking at come 2022. Right. I mean, the, the only the only thing that, that I know is that it's it's now state statute that the general election in November um, everyone gets a ballot. That's permanent. Um, but that does, but that's not, does not apply to the primaries and it doesn't apply to town meeting. Okay. Everybody gets a ballot in the mail. Yeah. That, right. Right. In yeah. November. Right. Okay. I think we have a decision on this one. Um, so let's move on to considering the town clerk's request for uh, regarding salary. Is it Emerson still there? 
It, yep, Emory's still here. You've got a, a letter from Emory in, in packets Three. that outlines the request. This is a, a budget neutral change and that this reflects what's in the agreement currently. It does bring him up into line with our department heads and leaves him a little bit behind some of the statewide averages pulled from the VLCT stuff. So it's movement, I think, in a direction towards that. The, the initial rate was, in many respects, probably artificially low. Um, and so it, it does help make up the ground from, from that starting point. It was based a lot, I think, on the position he was in prior, um, not necessarily the position he's in now with some of the responsibilities and the changes there. Um, so it, it, it certainly fits. There's no there's no budget impact and it, it does provide us, um, you know, it changes that baseline in a way that I think reflects where we're both want to be at and where we should be at in relationship to our peers and, and with him as a department head level employee of the town. So the request is to for to go up from 42,000 to 52,000 effective immediately or at the start of the next pay period to make it yeah, easy? I think start of the next pay period, yeah, because we'll, we'll be paid this week. So it'll be the start of the next pay period. And then because it's half a year, it, it's still, it's probably not even, um, it's less than, we'll still save money in that salary line because it'll be across the six months moving, moving out. Where are we? So December to June 6th, I think. So how was how the original initial salary set? How, what was the procedure for that? That was the amount I was hired on for as the assistant clerk in February for my training. Oh, so how come when, when Emery adopted the new position, he wasn't automatically increased? Why did he retain the the salary for a different position. Because it's the clerk treasurer's job to address the salary of that position. So my guess is he just continued on and because it didn't get brought forward, it didn't get addressed. For my personal ethics, I believe I should have given myself the traditional six months probation, which I did plus a little bit more. So probation, we get to fire you if you're not doing a good job. I don't think we had that right. No, was, our actual probation book. period, just yeah. to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> it was more of a letting myself get settled in the position. It, it also makes note of the fact that with some of the other changes organizationally, there's going to be a pretty steep learning curve to come up in skill set, particularly with the treasurer pieces of the operation that may have been supported differently through the finance department, but as there's transition there, there's sort of a need for everybody to kind of stand up as quickly as they can and, and really fully expand. So it, it, it does, I think at a certain level, account for the, the fact that there's going to be a little bit of stretching and growing that's going to happen while we're in this period and while somebody new comes in as well. Anybody have any questions, comments, or motions on this? I would move to uh, approve the town clerk treasurer's request. I'll second that. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is continuation of temporary payment process for firefighters. It's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> or I think one of the two, it's that uh, biannual event where they're due to be paid. Uh, the December payments, all three fire departments. The June one that we had together last was just the village fire department. The question that's been before the board a few times now, and in, in, there's a larger sort of policy question about paying by direct deposit versus a, a hybrid system. What you've done in the past, while there's a, a supposed to be an effort underway to resolve some of these bigger questions is, I mean, functionally what it is, is you're suspending the, the personnel policy section that would apply um, and require direct deposit. And then for it works out to be about, it was 10 firefighters um, in this last round for this 
um, pay period. I think they were all village and center. I think everybody out in East Randolph is on direct deposit um, at this point. And so we've just uh, essentially the board has suspended that provision of the policy and we've made the payments in accordance with what we've done historically. The, the 10 checks were at that point. Now we, we did process payroll this week with the 10 checks cut and printed. Um, so sort of anticipating that there'd be an action element. We're not at the end of the policy conversation where there's a longer term decision and sort of taking a bit of a gamble that you would improve another, approve another continuation um, of that policy suspension. And so we're really just looking to formalize that and then to put before you to consider whether you wanna do it just for this time. Each time has been, I think, instance specific. So this is the third time you've, you've done it if you, you go forward and you approve it. Um, so do you wanna do it once and then we'll come back in June if there's still nothing there and maybe use that as a way to, to motivate the effort through to completion or do you wanna just sort of say at this point until there's some sort of resolution, we'll leave this provision in place. And then in June, it goes down to that payroll period, something like four checks um, maybe, but it's across that smaller base. So it worked out, I counted them up in the payroll. It's 10 of the 58 firefighters are receiving a check and of the overall payroll run, it's 10 of 88 um, payments processes across categories. So it's, it's, it's still a pretty small, less than one in five at the most robust number, but, but they are hanging out there. So it's before you to consider the suspension and whether or not you wanna make it kind of a running thing or we'll come back to it in June. So in the fireman's policy, it does allow for paper checks as well as direct deposit in the policy that's coming. As a staff labor perspective, it's there's there's no real impact of, of this system. I don't know that we want to expand the number of checks, but... Um, <laughs> It wasn't noticeable in terms of, of when Michelle ran it. It was changing the stock in the printer and, and changing it back. Treaty will that in the new what's coming to us, will that be just for the people that are doing it now, or would anybody be able to ask for a check? The policy allows for them to be paid by check or direct deposit. So it's anybody who's a member of the fire department. The, the way it's di differentiated is the policy that's for the firefighters is being developed with the intent of showing them as volunteers, not town employees. And so the policy that's being put together is to give them their own policy to follow versus having to fall under the policy as an employee. Questions, action items? Well, I, yeah, I think I'm gonna make a motion that we uh, allow the current policy to stay in place and I think I'm just going to say for an indefinite period so we don't have to revisit this again in the future. So the current policy is direct deposit only? No, I thought it was direct deposit or wasn't it an option? That's in the draft policy that's being developed. Oh, that's in the draft policy. Oh, I thought it was, okay. So I, all right, well. <clears throat> the current practice has been for checks or direct deposit. Okay, so I guess I'm sticking with current practice then. There you go. I'll second that. To a motion and a second. All those in favor? Okay. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Stained? Motion carries. Other business? Got the five or six items. Oh, sorry, other was wrapped in. I jumped ahead on you, Trina. I'm sorry. I have another business question. Did we ever look into whether we should be raising the cemeteries costs? The um, plot costs and the, and the maintenance? 
think that came up maybe before you were here. Sir. Yeah, I'm gonna say it's not an effort we've undertaken since April, but I can look to see if there's anything done on what that would require. I think wasn't that going to Randy Garner to somebody? Maybe Adolfo was going to talk with Randy about it. We had this discussion before. We before. did have this discussion, but the cemetery committee didn't think it was their job to look at those rates. Um, if I remember what their response was correctly. Uh, and I believe Adolfo was going to push back on them that it was. I think that's where we left it. By the cemetery committee, you mean Randy? Commissioner, right? Pretty much, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, it's just functionally just Randy right. at the moment. Yeah. $180 yeah. three lots seems pretty cheap. <laughs> it's a deal, yeah. <laughs> this was a year in which we did 40, I don't know. 40 plus burials, I think we ended up at. And in a normal year, a regular year, the average is somewhere around 15. Um, so you think of where that capacity went. And it created strain throughout the, the building and ground system. Um, some of that was pent up COVID. Some of that was like they had a run in the fall of, of folks who passed away of various reasons and you know, COVID related, not sort of pent up demand, just tragedies and, and natural passings and a series of things like that. It would be nice to see how we compare with other places. If we shouldn't do something. The league used to, I think, collect data like that. I don't know if they have for years, but we can, we can see. It used to be that there, you'd have the salary survey would be one, and then you have this other set of costs, so you can compare zoning fees and Cemetery fees. Yeah. I don't know that they've done that for a while, though. But we can look to see if maybe they have and just missed it somehow. Yeah. The same on maintenance fees. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other items under other business? Hearing none, grants. There are no grant requests to consider. One of the things I want to try to do is actually create a master list of grants that are out there, both applied for, open. We've got a lot of things floating around in different places and it would just be nice to be able to see them kind of in one spot and know what's where and how and, and when decisions are made and, and right down to when, when our reimbursement timelines and stuff like that, especially as we're, um, you know, bringing new people on or, or people in new roles. So that, that's on the to-do list. I don't know when we'll get there, but and then to keep that moving forward so that we always know, know where we're at. All right, manager's report. On our, in our packet, we have a list, we have letters from ARPA committee members. Is that just for us to look at right now? We're not discussing tonight. Yeah, we put those in under the manager's report just to say, here's who's already in. One of the things you had set up when you talked about scope work in those pieces were committee and geographic, um, you know, certain levels of representation among there. So we've got some candidates that are interested and qualified, um, but we put the posting out there a little bit longer to see if we can meet those goals. It doesn't impact uh, the overall timeline um, for what we're proposing to do. Um, we were unlikely to convene and meet probably before the end of the calendar yet year anyway um, with some of the holiday and other stuff going on um, so we should be able to do that in january a point and hopefully get everybody up and running and i think at that point even if we don't have some of the other markers yet we may at least want to start the process and see if we can augment it as we go and bring people on or we'll figure out how to, ways to, to cover some of those other perspectives throughout throughout the process that way we can meet the the overall end goal of even if it was uh, like a may kind of a timeline but you have everything in there so you can start looking at it, considering it, see who's who's put in. Most of the hits, I think, have come from the front porch forum postings. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we, we went back out there just to, to keep that rolling. 
I saw a quick draft of the audit, so I think we'll be able to do that on the 13th for sure. Um, that presentation, there was an off chance we could have squeezed it in tonight, but it was Tuesday at 5.30, and at that point, we'd already posted everything around town. And, um, so it's, it's being done. Cliff's helping us out with that, which I'm very appreciative for, um, and then just trying to get it across the finish line. We're not anticipating anything in there that which would be um, really very interesting. It should be a very boring audit, which is exactly <laughs> you what you want to hear. Um, and then um, the only other one was um, not having been through the process before, and I talked to, to Tim Angel the other day, the Randolph Center Fire Station property tax exemption. Because it's been one year for the last couple of years, is that something the board has put on the warning or something that they've had to do by a petition? And then just in asking now, it's more about if they've got to do a petition, they've got plenty of time to start sooner, but not remembering what the, or not knowing in my case, what the process has been um, and then which way you wanted to do it. And then whether it's a, the range is from the one year we do currently to the five years in statute, but not necessarily that you got to determine that piece tonight, but just something to consider. At some point, we'll have to set budget hearings. It looks like they've been done December, January. I think one year they were maybe done both in January. I can't find a good document that says what's expected in terms of those, just, just that they've happened at different points. I don't know if we want to set dates, need to set dates. Um, from my perspective, as the one trying to pick it up and carry it across the, the goal line, um, January certainly gives me a little more time to get familiar with the, the components and then to, to add some of the pieces we, we've talked about or some of the things we know have changed. We'll have our property and casualty insurance rates, for example, and update those. We'll know what the health insurance rates are and what our mix is likely to be. There might be some refinements there. We've got some salary adjustments between Emory staying and new employees and some kind of things just to make sure we've, we've really got in there. Um, so there'll be some adjustments to the version that the budget committee last saw, just through the nature of things. Uh, but we'll need to set those hearings, and, and and then we can highlight what some of the open questions might be, particular to other areas of need. But it helps me spit, take some time with. And it's like trying to get inside Cliff's brain and then figure out how to navigate around. Um, <laughs> and when your brain's maybe wired different, differently, you gotta. Get yourself oriented and then figure out how to do it. It's all, it's all there. I just have to sort of learn the pathways. Well, that would give us time to make changes if we wanted to. Yeah, yeah. We're really <clears throat> up against that January 30th deadline. I mean, I, it's nice to be about at least a week to 10 days prior to that with everything because we do this time to kind of proof it, go through it, get it reviewed if we need to, and then. You can make adjustments up to that point, but if you've got something you don't like or an error and we pass the 30th, then it's where we might be stuck with whatever it is or, or looking for some other kind of adjustment. But it, it's getting compact, but it, there's nothing wild or crazy in that draft. Um, you know, no replacement of the manager's car with a, an all electric sports car, but. Must yeah, but it's, it seems pretty vanilla. So, Trini, we put uh, Randolph Center Fire Department on ourselves, right? But the question is for how long? Uh, last year, we waived the signatures for them and put them on for a year. Yeah, we did that a couple of years. Didn't we? Well, that was because it was voted on in town meeting three years ago. It was taken off the five year schedule and it was put on a one year schedule. Yeah. Correct. You want to at least for tonight just say that you'll you'll put it on again in some form so they don't have to petition and then that still buys some time to think about if it's one again. Um, like I said, the max is five. You can go anywhere between one and five, really. Um, so you can stick, stick with the one. It just gives them some sense of what the process is going to be. Is there any reason not to go back to five years or two years? Or? No, the, the, the whole vote to go down to one was because they wouldn't get into an agreement with the town. 
to give us what we needed to get the insurance in place. Right. Uh, and you and I went and had that great meeting with them and yep. ended up with an agreement. Um, so I think as long as the agreement is still valid, then there's no reason not to go to a multi-year. Yeah. I mean, that's, that was my understanding too. So I, I would be like, you know, happy to put it back on for five years so we don't have to keep revisiting this. I'd be willing to go out as long as the agreement's still effective. Yeah. Okay. That's so if there's three years left of the agreement. Then there's three years that we put out. Yep. All right. So Trevor, not can out pay for that. that sounds fine. So let's, yeah, that sounds like a, a good idea. And if they want to extend the agreement, then <laughs> you can give them five years. Yep. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Any questions on the manager's report? If not, a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, and we will take a five-minute break while everybody clears out and